Hello and welcome to the Baby Giants Investing Podcast. Join us as we chat about the weird and wild world of small cap investing, all while searching for the precious few fast-growing businesses that have a shot at becoming industry giants. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and is strictly not intended as financial advice. Any opinions of general nature and do not take into account your personal circumstances, needs or objectives. Securities mentioned are for illustration purposes only and this podcast should not influence investment decisions. You should read the relevant PDS and consider speaking to a financial advisor before making investment decisions. Past performance is no indicator of future returns. Podcast guests and their clients may hold positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. All right, we're live. We've got Andrew and Claude in the house today, back in full team. Yeah, we've got a couple of things we're going to chat about. A company called Adrad, which Andrew just met with in Strawman, and one that I'd looked at a little while ago. So it'll be interesting. Maybe some small camp news. Kick off with some good news. Do either of you gents have any good news this week? Um, on the spot? No, no, go for it. You, you've got. You've always got some good ones up your sleeve. Yeah. Air quality in Europe shows significant improvements over the last two decades. I guess that's some energy and environment news. Okay. The first human transplant of a genetically modified pig kidney has been performed. Huh. There you go. Okay. Did it work? <laughs> <laughs> the surgery was performed. I just so read the like, headlines, like, Andrew. Just, I don't know. Like, is there a conclusion to that? Oh, the dude died really quickly. Yeah, seems- <laughs> but we did it. We did it. <laughs> it seems to have worked from what I can see. Yeah, that, yeah, there we go. I think there's some, basically pigs are very similar to us. We can um, potentially modify or do some overlap between the two. It can be a, a new source of medicine, so medical solutions for us. Here's the last one for you. First cow to produce human insulin and its milk has been created in Brazil. I feel as though I've heard that before. Maybe they were just working on it. So it's been done now. You can drink some yeah, milk and get apparently. your insulin hit. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's a transgenic animal, meaning DNA from another species. In this case, human was introduced to it through genetic engineering. I think this is kind of like going towards the idea where you could kind of grow like a lot of products that we currently create in like steel vats and whatever mm, else. And mm. um, yeah, I think it's kind of cool. That's pretty cool. I got one for you. I don't know if good news or whatever, but it's just, it's up the AI alley and that's just so hot right now. So how can it you is. not? Did you hear about Devon? It was more, it was one of these AI agents like uh, focused on software engineering. It sounds like and- it's going to go bad. Because right, of the name, definitely. Yeah, I don't know. It just sounds like that's like the one that becomes malicious. <laughs> it sounds like an acronym, doesn't it? Like uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. doomsday. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Like I'm not quick yeah. enough to come up with one. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, there's. I just saw a thread, and and they had very broad prompts, and it will it will sketch out the whole architecture. It'll go, and you can connect it to the API documentation. Just you can code and recode in various different languages and different stacks and just even if i'm tempted to try it out actually because i'd be a perfect candidate because i knew nothing about coding someone like you guys who have had a bit of dipped your toe in that I, you might find it pretty powerful so so yeah. it's mo- mostly for coding it's so like, entirely focused entirely on coding, on coding. Yep. yeah cool yeah and so it's got a lot of integrations and stuff with i mean again i'm out of my depth here but in terms of the, the compilers and the tools and stuff that are sort of generally used it can like access github and Rah, 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 rah. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And it's, it's cool to see, it's cool to see things going, I think, as we discussed previously, but more, more niche and finding sort of domain specializations. Yeah. It's pretty wild how coding is like the most applicable use case, yeah. you know, like the most practical use case aside from write, writing poems and songs or whatever like if you're thinking a few years ago we always thought that would be the last thing to go yeah. and it might have been, might be the first not that it's going but being enhanced you know i think you still want a human to understand and and watch it at least yeah but it's just it's one of those it's one of those 10x productivity gains kind of thing so it's not mm-hmm. like the human code is gone by any stretch but it's just like now you can do a lot more a lot faster yeah got a long weekend coming up yay there you go <laughs> That's one for human progress. Hey, we yes. have holidays. That's that's pretty cool. Should be more. I can't believe there isn't a like public holiday party. Like, come on, like stop going for a four day week. Just be like they... one more public holiday. One more public holiday. One more public holiday. You <laughs> there get used... there eventually. There used to be a three day weekend party. I think they might might still be kicking around. I've been known to throw, uh, a, throw a vote that way or two. Like a you know what? A, like every a... weekend's a three day weekend. Yeah, three day weekend. That's their single issue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can get behind that. I would like to vote for a public holiday party that just tries to add more and more public holidays, like just incrementalist <laughs> kind of approach. Like we're just, first we just want one more and then they just continue. And then eventually, hopefully you do basically have a three day weekend mm-hmm. um, yeah. as much as possible. Because like the one thing is right, there's undeniable that somehow it has happened whereby the, like even though as technology improves massively and takes over more and more part of our lives, like 
how is it that you still need to work nine to five plus, you know, a bit extra in Sydney to even like afford shelter over your head? It oh, doesn't bro. make any sense. Bro, have I got a solution for you? Let's let's grab a beer. <laughs> yeah, it I'm doesn't. I mean, that, think about, think that, about you, that you manage to make, make a monster on Bitcoin and buy a house out of it. But, you know, the... No, but it's an excellent should... question. I just want to double. I think what you say there is actually quite a profound question. Like, why? Why is it we've got the best technology we've ever had, and we're working as hard as we ever have? I mean, that's that's an interesting question. I think it's just human. Human wants are infinite, right? Like, you could live at a nineteen fifties or nineteen forties level for a fraction of what you spend, and have the same level no, of couldn't. technology. You no. could. Of course, no. you could. The people, the, the people who bought houses in that era were doing it on a single income at much lower multiples. So you, you, I, I would say yes. The the yeah, but imagine all the, the stuff you spend. The house. All the stuff you spend, you used to spend on just like meat and vegetables. Like you wouldn't have any of the technology we're talking on, any labor saving devices. Like all the stuff that you do wouldn't be. You'd be your your budget, your spending would be slashed if you lived at those lifestyle. I, well, don't, don't, aren't the stats that like currently like people are spending a greater percentage of their disposable income on housing, whether it be mortgages or, or rents than, than at any point. So it's kind of like, and, and these are just fundamental things that will have always been in demand and will always be in demand. So that yeah. food, do you know, so we've got iPhones and, and Facebook, but you know, we're still working a crap ton just to put a roof over our heads. I, I, yeah, I agree. So I think that, that it's because it's, it's a competitive thing, right? So you're competing for the same bit of land in Sydney. And so because all your, all your other costs have fallen so much, it like absorbs the slack because you're willing to keep spending to compete for the same bit of land in Sydney. It's kind of like you could spend an infinite amount because you're competing with other people. It's a, what do you want to call that effect? It's like a zero sum competition. Yeah, I think the percentage of people's income that they have to spend on shelter, whether that be rent or a mortgage or whatever, has definitely gone up. And that's eaten away at some of those like potential gains. And then other areas where it's also gone up, which relatively, you know, you could still get a good education back in the 1950s or whatever. The amount that people have to spend on education has also gone up a lot. And in America, also healthcare. In Australia, I don't really know the numbers on healthcare, given that we do have at least a somewhat working public system. Yeah. I mean, education is also somewhat zero sum as well, because you didn't use to get a university education right like a lot of people because you didn't need to but now you kind of need to to get into a lot of jobs so but my yeah, parents generation got university education for free in australia yeah yeah for sure but like the percentage of people going to uni was much lower as well and so mm -hmm. you didn't you didn't even need to do it quote unquote the more the same job. i think about the jobs market now i think oh you know, I'd almost encourage my kid, I'd encourage my kid to like do a trade except for the, so it's a really interesting question because I think that probably the, the relaxing employment prospects are best if you went and became, you know, an electrician or, or a plumber or something like that. The, the reason being is because the, you know, it'd be very, it'd be very possible to be in like extremely good electrician and a very competent one, um, competent one. And to me, like some, doing something like, electrical engineering and being an electrician probably has better job prospects now than you know like i i always regret doing law like it's an unimaginative do what your dad did kind of choice but like i also think you know arts degrees law th there's so many others as well like accounting probably to some degree coding as well there's a lot of those white collar jobs that that probably the prospects are going to get like worse and worse like co being a software developer has been great if you're our age because that's when the demand supply imbalance has come about but is that going to be the same in another 10 20 years i don't know especially since given with ai like as you guys were talking about so i feel like something that melds practicality with knowledge is probably I think I think medicine still has great potential for like earning once you reach the apex of it. But for some reason, you know, the doctors and the various colleges of anesthesiology or this, that and the other, you know, they make it so hard to get in that people sacrifice decades of their life just to become the thing. And then, yeah, they get to charge insane amounts because of the shortage of it. But there's a bigger problem here, which is we have way more people that are smart enough to be an anesthesiologist, but we're just making it impossible for the numbers to go up so that, you know, those people can, who do make it can charge so much. It's, it's like the old fashioned guild thing. And I don't know if that's actually a good path for the individual, because yes, you'll probably be rich in the end, but at what cost, you know, you've slaved away for 20 years or, or 15 years or whatever to get there. Pretty tough road. That concludes our good news section. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and any anesthesiologists, if you want to like write in and correct me on my like, you know, my my two bits on it, like feel free. I'm not trying to be an expert here. One other, so this isn't really good news, but just kind of a, a random thing I came across, which I thought was kind of interesting. Do you remember in like the early 2010s, or there was a paper in 2010 which said basically after a country goes past 90 percent debt, it's like economic growth declines or it like shows a, a slowdown and a you know real growth stops do you, yep. do you guys ever hear that yeah it, it was like well. a very big deal at the time and like europe basically went into austerity to avoid this fear of like real economic growth slowing to a 0.1 percent decline and it was yeah huge deal i just remember it being a big deal at the time it's like the whole reason that the eurozone like refused to you know keep spending up and kind of cut costs and all the pain that that went through it turns out and this is actually quite old news but it was new news to me it turns out that that was the kind of core of that 2010 academic paper by Reinhard and Rogoff, two very like well-respected economists, was just like an Excel sheet spreadsheet floor. And it was literally like they didn't drag across the formula from 15 columns to 20 columns. So they left out five countries. If you include those five countries, which includes Australia and a couple others, economic growth actually increased 2.2%. So they had this world changing, affecting hundreds of millions of people view that uh, debt of to GDP past 90% leads to this like, you know, big fall in growth. Hundreds of millions of people was affected by it. It was literally as simple as of an error. It was discovered back in 2013 and just like, I don't know, I never heard about it, which is kind of surprising because we heard the first fact, but not the second. Sorry. So, so just to clarify, the people who did the study didn't. Mm -hmm. didn't yeah. The, the famous economist that was discovered. And then the Euro acted on that. They, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could say maybe they wanted to act anyway, and this was justification, mm -hmm. but it was a very big, like, extremely well-respected economists. They wrote who, this time it's different, it. right? Yes, that that's thought. right. It was, yeah. So uh, I think the gross for the 2011 bestseller was Next Time is Different. So I don't know if that's the same book that you're thinking of or if this oh, is. Oh, I thought it was this time. Maybe there was a follow-up. Okay. That's what I'm reading anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, when the error was corrected, that 0.1% decline became a 2.2% average increase in economic growth, which I guess probably just relates to your spending more money and that kind of like stir, you know, stirs the spirits of growth and whatever else. But it's mm -hmm. just bizarre. Like, And it's such a simple, it wasn't even, didn't even sound like an extremely complex spreadsheet. It was literally dragging across from 15 columns to 20 columns. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought it's kind of wild and just kind of, I don't know what to, what to take from it. <laughs> Being cautious of like relying too much on one academic study. Yeah. Just, and how long it takes to correct. Like we've all heard of that first study, but not really heard of the error that was later discovered that like changed the view on it. That is crazy. I can't believe I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you since 2010, the Euro M2 money supply has doubled. So they've, they've, <laughs> it's been plenty of liquidity added to the system. Mm, yeah. Cool. Any other, <laughs> any other weird economic news? Any other, any other stuff? going on that way for you guys what did we have on the macro side of things I, it seemed as though power was more sort of yeah wanting to cut yeah dovish it seems to match like the kind of thesis we've had of the fed being pretty dovish for the rest of the election year and then yeah. see what happens yeah if course. trump gets re-elected and whatever else i mean the only other thing i'd seen was just how much ahead trump is versus biden like at this time in the polls versus clinton and biden the first time you know Biden and Clinton were ahead or you know, very close. And now Trump's just a blowout ahead currently in national polls. So. Isn't, it, isn't there something with him where he uh, is required to post a certain amount of money in regard to one of the lawsuits filed against him? He was misrepresenting his wealth and using that to you know, essentially false collateral, fraudulently claimed. And there's something like an insane amount of money, like a third of a billion dollars or something that he doesn't have, at least doesn't have in liquid assets or something. And that yeah. he's, he's actually put out a bond, or offered some kind, if this doesn't scare you, you know, off, offered, I think, I forget the name of the term, but some corporate bonds or whatever in like basically asking companies, can you stump up the cash for me? And you've got to think, what is the quid pro quo? Like behind closed doors, what's the, hey, give us some money. So when I'm president, I will XXX. Like how else are you selling that that bond, right? It's wild. Yeah, that is wild to think about. But yeah, I think at some point the world will start thinking about what happens post-Trump. And yeah, I think we'd kind of talked about it before. Like this time, it seems like it'll be different. He's much more like drain the swamp. There's a lot of talk of this army of people he wants to bring in. So I don't know what the implications of that are scary yeah, probably different to last time <laughs> yeah it could be seriously all right well, maybe we should get into some stocks andrew you'd uh, chatted to adrad recently do you want to just give a rundown of what they do for folks who aren't familiar yeah it's it's a really interesting well 
let's let's be honest. It's a pretty boring company at the surface level. It's, yeah. it's one of these companies where it's been in private hands for forever. Like I think 1985, it was formed. It listed in 2022. So they basically, a, a originally a manufacturer and supplier of radiator parts, but they also so now they sort of import and distribute those kinds of things. Uh, automotive, sorry, also original equipment manufacturer for industrial heat transfer solutions. So the way that it was explained was basically anything that needs heat taken away from it pretty fast <laughs> and where that's important to do. So it's interesting because Daryl Abotomy of Burson and Bapcor fame is a non-executive director and just recently stepped down as a temporary CEO. Daryl, for those that have been around for a while, know, did wonderful things at Bapcor and really sort of laid the foundations for growth. We also spoke to Rod Hislop, the CFO. And the play here is it's a business where, you know, it's just a, it's just a very established, profitable, I should say, dividend paying business, which has been in private hands without a much of a focus on capital allocation return on investment investment capital it just hasn't been it just hasn't been run optimally if you want to put it that way not to be not to throw shade at the former operators of the business again you know a, a, a long standing profitable successful business but now on the on the public markets with some pretty capable insiders the hope here is that they can just really improve like working capital inventory turnover product development all those kinds of things so yeah i'll, I'll probably shut up at this point other than just to note that recently in the in the recent half they had what you like to see so you know sort of mid to upper single digit revenue growth but then the profit and ebitda growth growing much faster than that as they start to sort of realize some of these like efficiency gains. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. They're doing stuff in Thailand. Uh, again, that sort of might ring a bell from, from the Babcor days in terms of a manufacturing facility over there. And yeah, I just, I just think it's really interesting. So what did, what did you think when you looked at it, Matt? Yeah, I, I looked at this actually as it was coming to IPO or, you know, through that IPO process. And yeah, I guess my, so your, your kind of view was that it hadn't been that well run before and it's kind of getting some new leadership. Is that... Well, that's what Daryl said to us. Yeah. No, and he didn't, I, I got to be clear, he didn't, didn't say, say that. Exactly I'm inferring that. <laughs> here that it was this basket case of a business. It wasn't. It was just, it was kind of that classic sort of family run business, you know, with all the employees have family. And it's just like a really good story. It's just, mm. it just hasn't, wasn't run with like the laser eyed discipline that someone like Daryl, I think was very heavily suggesting that, look, there's a lot of low hanging fruit that we can, we can pick here that'll move the dial in terms of the metrics that matter. That's interesting. Cause that's like, that's actually what we picked up at the IPO, which was under a different management team right before the change yes was that it just felt a bit family run and a bit not i don't want to say haphazard but just not yeah just not that same approach that you'd kind of want so yeah that's actually i don't know feels good that we thought that <laughs> yeah and of course now they've got the access to the to the mm. to the capital markets that are, are there they can I, I imagine the the cost of capital is much better now to sort of realize not just so there's not just a story of cost out and efficiency gains but also you know investment in terms of new products they do a lot of bespoke products for even things like you wouldn't think data centers right like they need cooling they've got mm. kit for that so there there are growth and investment opportunities and so that's sort of another another element that a more seasoned operator or if someone of, of larger scale operations might be able to bring to the fore. Yeah, I remember the data centers. Everyone got very excited about that yeah. at the time, yeah. <laughs> which is fair. They just needed to throw AI into the mix. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> True, AI uses a lot of heat. Yeah, it does. creates a lot of heat. Yeah, I guess the... I so guess to be the, fair, this makes it at least equally an AI co a company as a Appen was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess the other thought I'd have is just like how hard it is to change culture once, you know, like the, it's, so it's one true. thing to kind of change the CEO, but like, can you change the culture of the business to be more, you know, focused on capital allocation kind of all the way through and efficiency and whatever else? I guess that would be my first thought. On that culture point, there was one small, well, I wouldn't actually say small, there was a red flag that I just thought I'd throw in there because I just haven't seen it like mentioned anywhere. One of the subsidiaries, Air, Radius, Air Radiators, had an incident that occurred at the manufacturing facility located in Victoria as a result of which an employee of Air Radiators suffered fatal injuries. WorkSafe Victoria has reviewed the available evidence in the context of its general prosecution guidelines and decided to take no further action against Air Radiators at this time. So this is not, apparently they're not being prosecuted for this death at work but i do think that i mean i would put that on the list of slight i guess like culture or whatever you know that ephemeral you're hard to know where to put it in a 
in a spreadsheet, but to me that is a negative. Like I don't understand the details of whatever happened there, but somebody actually dying in the, their work is pretty. It's a pretty major thing. Mm. When did that happen, Claude? I don't actually know. It, that note I picked up on because it was in the most recent report, and it doesn't actually say when that happened. Yeah, but okay. I think you could safely say, given that you know this is being reported now, it probably was you know prior to listing. Yeah, I'll just look it up now. Might yeah. Say. Cool. No, I think that is for any of these, I mean, obviously there, there's always risk when you're in manufacturing or any other businesses that are dealing with the real world heavy equipment stuff, but it is always a massive focus on the companies that have a good culture is safety. It's no, normally always one of the biggest things that they talk about. It's like their pillars, safety is always first. So you do need to drive that all the way through an organization. So yeah, I do think it's worth mentioning. That's, in that's culture. true Not too, to say but... that they, it indicates it's good or bad because it happened because it can happen anywhere. But... That's the thing. Like I think one data point sounds so inhumane but a data point is of one is is that a freak accident what are the situations or is that a result of negligent operating standards or whatever so it's you know you just can't know i think you know obviously if there was a pattern of workplace incidents that's a massive red flag and you, you want to yeah, be aware so of I that i think it looks like that was in 2021 that that happened i think i don't know we don't have a lot of details i feel like that would be an interesting thing to ask about though But it would be good to have more information about that. Like personally, I would get a better feel for culture of a company if there was a little bit more of like a deep dive into why somebody died rather than just like a quick paragraph saying we're not getting prosecuted, which on its face is a good sign, right? Because it means that the people who are supposed to, you know, look at this and have looked at it, they've said, well, no, we're not going to prosecute you, implying that they don't think it's their fault, but still more information would be useful. I just don't, I I hear what you're saying. I don't, I don't know where I'd start with that. I I could ask management and as you say, they're not going to, they're not going to go anywhere they don't want to or have to. And I mean, are you going to have access? I mean, how do you, how do you even start like with, with an analysis? I think all you can do is basically say, okay, well, that's a concern. You know, I, I, one time's an accident. You know, what, what is it? One time's an accident, twice a coincidence, three times is, is, you know, there's something that's going on there. I think you're right, but of all of the things to worry about in terms of risks, I don't even think that'd be in my top 10 for Adrad at the moment. And maybe that's, maybe that's wrong and that will be revealed, but it's very, it's, it's one, it's one, the thing about Fortescue medals, right? I can remember a number of times they've had to deal with fatalities on site and it's just, would have that, and this again, sounds very insensitive, but one way or the other, would that have made any difference to the long-term fortunes of that business and, and shareholder outcomes? I don't know. I don't know. Am I, am I being too brutal with that? But, uh, you know. Maybe um, jumping into the business itself. Yeah, I guess the, so the idea is like it's kind of not the turnaround, but it's had improved outcomes now. It's got a new CEO coming in and then kind of just steady growth. Is that kind of the idea, Andrew? Is that- yeah. Yeah. So st- steady, steady growth, improving margins. And if I can click around quick enough. <laughs> so I just did a very back of the napkin kind of sort of scenario. So they did just shy of 16 million in EBITDA last year. They've sort of said we're, we're on track to grow that by about 5 to 8%. So I don't know, what's that? For the FY24, 17 odd million in EBITDA. So assume a similar kind of ratio as last year, that's 6 million in NPAT. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't put them on much of a, a PE at this point in time. So I think it's not a vast growing tech company that's going to grow at 20, 30% compound for a long time. But I do think it is in an interesting space where it's got, it's got a lot of supply agreements with some big customers like Linfox and stuff as well. So it's got a good base of, of customers when radiators break, they break and you need to keep this heavy gear and stuff on the road. So there's, I think there's a good baseline of organic growth plus the potential for some, some interesting allocation, whether that be sort of trying to sort of broaden into new geographies or product types or, or even just outright acquisitions. So yeah, it's one to watch. I, I just think it's interesting. I put a, I put a uh, watching position on Strawman. I haven't got any in real life yet, but it's, it's something that I want to do a bit more work on. What a, one of the kind of bearish case I'd seen of it was that you know a lot of the radiators that's producing are for internal combustion engines and yeah basically whether they still uh whether an, an electric vehicle needs as much and yeah, yeah i ask. guess just either about that it's not just whether they need any cooling because i know that batteries do it's i guess it's the transition there right like are you going to yeah. be the leader in that technology and do you have to redo all your factories blah 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 so that was an interesting one and that that rung bells for me too because you remember back in in the day there was a worry around babcor's business 
Yeah, yeah, I, very, I remember in 2015, a report from a futurist, Tony Sieber, who said That's that it. every car you buy today is a stranded asset. And if you're buying a car today, you're, you're an idiot, an internal combustion car. And meanwhile, 2024, <laughs> and we still have yeah, whatever it is. So I asked Daryl about that and actually, because I said, I remember you showing me a slide and he said, that's, well, you know, it's, it's a few years old, but it's exactly the same. And his argument one, it's not, it's very easy for these kind of discussions with EVs. They kind of get ideological pretty quickly, but it's just like, look, even if there is a continued rapid uptake, the aging of the car park, as it's called, is such that there is, there is going to be a lot of, you know, ongoing demand for what they do. And it's not just ICE engines that they're doing radiators for. It's not, it's not the bog standard kind of stuff. And that electric vehicles still do require uh, radiator solutions as well. So it's not, again, I, I don't want to be, I'm coming out all fanboyish for, for Adrad. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm pretty fanboyish when it comes to Daryl. I think he's a really great operator. <laughs> <laughs> but th these are, I think these are risks that are definitely worth having on your radar, but they're not immediate risks. Like the world is not changing that fast. And I think you would get a sense of it. So, and again, it's not like this is trading at some insanely high multiple where there's a lot of, you know, hopium and, and, and goodwill infused into the price at this point in time. So yeah, I think I, I, I would downplay, again, I would not dismiss that risk i would downplay it yeah i'm yeah. with you i can sometimes like establish in like establish industrial companies on around 15 times earnings so like not the most dangerous thing to invest in like, really probably not. Not, you're not going to shoot the lights out but you're not going to do super badly either like hey i'm um, just on the topic of ev transition i think i sent you guys the thing of vaclav smills latest piece on getting to net zero i don't know if you read it's like 20 pages i'm just kind of interested in your thoughts and i can give my thoughts on the ev on, on first on evs because we talked about that a bit before but i think it is becoming relevant for like a lot of businesses are we actually going to transition fully to electric vehicles is it going to be like a plateau that it reaches and i guess the other point from vaclav smell who for those who don't know me is kind of obscure he's like i'd say probably the leading one of the leading energy analysts and and like a very deep style of energy analyst like he's written probably like i don't know maybe 12 books about various types of energy technology etc and i guess he's like if you're thinking about the transition He's the guy who deeply understands current reality. So like how we talk about how no one or most people today tend to like be office workers who don't understand how anything actually works. Like one of his books that I really enjoyed was How the World Actually Works. <laughs> sort <laughs> of on the bookshelf really behind Yeah, you. yeah. Which is just describing the like immense complexity of all the things that happen around us to like make, you know, the machine appear at your house, like all the stuff that goes in behind it. And I, I think after reading that, I could, we could put it in the show notes, but after reading that, I don't think, like we know that we're not on track for, you know, the 2030 goals of reducing CO2 by 45%, but it's not like we're not on track. It's like we're not, it's not like remotely on track. Like if I was putting a probability on the world, like the world's only increased since 2010, our carbon emissions, like pretty steadily every year. Even COVID, COVID was the only year we had a, a real down year. Are you factoring in the um, offsets there, Matt? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so I couldn't help myself. <laughs> pretty sure there's a financial product that's going to yeah, solve, yeah, solve yeah, that. Financial it's product will solve problem. it. But yeah, just that it's it. There's a lot of layers to it, but there's a yeah a lot that you need to change. There's a lot of delays with everything you need to change. There's a lot of but if I was putting a probability on the 2030 goals, again, we'd have to halve emissions in the next six years. Like this is what is legislated in a lot of countries. I would say like way less than one percent chance that we do that. It would have to be some kind of honestly, it'd have to be a disaster. It'd have to be like a a world ending disaster to do it because there's not much else that could do it. Or even a breakthrough technology, I don't think would be rolled out that fast. And then you're kind of left with 2050 and net zero. I think, again, I'd, I'd, based on that, I'd be really low. But yeah, so I guess uh, I, two thoughts. One is just the more immediate one of, is the EV transition starting to plateau? And then I guess two is more like, are these what happens when these goals are missed? Because I'd say, at least in my reading, and I, I haven't heard anyone that's that optimistic about it, even people who kind of like think about a lot about the transition, or I talked to a company, a CEO who is invested in literally, a, you know, driving the transition i guess you'd say invested in that they don't they're not very bullish on these things happening either so like what happens after 2030 when we haven't hit any of our targets globally does anything start to change do people start to focus on adaptation or you know living with it or just get really depressed <laughs> i don't know but yeah i'll throw that open interested in your guys thoughts on either evs or just what happens if we start missing these transition targets and I, I think what's happened is we live in a world where we think it's just opinion that matters like it's kind of like after COVID it's like the lockdowns were something we could just kind of do we could choose to do them as well and so everyone got very excited like oh look at how much we can coordinate let's just all choose to do that 
but no one, very few people have thought through what's actually required to do it. And I'm not arguing either way, but it's just, I don't think, I think everyone just, yeah, it's just all agree to do it without actually doing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's just this weird, it seems like the biggest, I don't know, open secret. Because if you just look at anyone who calculates the numbers, it's just not, it's just not happening. Hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the... I'm definitely, I think the numbers are pretty obvious. Like electric vehicles aren't going to solve the climate problem, right? Like they are a source, a big source of emissions, but there's whole, like I think agriculture might even be bigger, you know? Yeah. For so transport 16%, cars are 8%. So if we completely made cars right. carbon free, they'd solve 8% of the problem, which is like th- four years of growth, you yeah. know, for the rest of the system. Plus if it's an electric vehicle isn't like carbon free, like it's no. You have to drive it for maybe 50,000 miles before you recoup it. So obviously it's a lot lower carbon, mm. but yeah, just, just the, and that gets you back to that scale of this idea of zero by 50 and how hard it is. Sorry to cut yeah. off, Andrew. No, no, I mean, that's, I, I'm, I'm glad to put some numbers to it because I was actually surprised how I thought it was bigger than that. But And that's our lives, right? right? Like we, our yeah. interfaces, most people's mm. with carbon fuels is filling up our gas tank. So that's mm-hmm. kind of, that's why we anchored to it. Like I would have thought 30% or 20% yeah. or something before I started diving into it. Yeah, I mean, so there's that. I mean, so, I mean, I, I tend to think, I don't know, maybe I'm too ardent a capitalist, but I, I, I do tend to think you'd need a market solution and not an orchestrated market solution. I just, I mean, Tesla's been, I mean, there's a lot to be said. We could talk for hours about Tesla, but they kind of made it cool. And I, I just see them more and more and more on the road. And a lot of these people are buying it for environmental reasons, but a lot of just buying because it it's a cool car too, right? And the plan has always been, and it seems to some extent be sort of working where the, you know, as as the as they scale up, things come down the cost curve. It's also enforced a lot of other people to come into the market as well. There's a lot of adjacencies of this technology, you know, so it's sort of like now we're chucking this these batteries in cars but you know there's power walls there's other solutions that are sort of adjacent to that kind of stuff which can all sort of help drive you know broader application but yeah it 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 can get pretty disappointing when you actually just look at it like say okay what what could happen and then if you start from there just like imagine some really benevolent agi takes over the world and says right i'm going to fix this even then it's like that's a that's decades right to kind of yeah transition the whole take us off the fossil fuel tea just for for production for Mm. logistics for everything that we do is going to be super 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 hard so it's it'll likely be a a a whole variety of smorgasbord of solutions that are used but they will be used i think at the end of the day it will need to be a self-interest driven thing because not many not enough people are going to act purely altruistically but when it is like well this is better it's not really give a crap if it runs on petrol or oil or gas or electricity. It's just better. That that's kind yeah. of what and needs that's to what happen. Tesla did with electric cars for sure. Yeah. Like yeah, I think that's true. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Claude? Yeah, sure. I mean, so fifteen years ago or so, I thought that it was really possible for the world to you know address the climate change transition our energy systems away from fossil fuels. I still think we should try to do that, but you know, there's this mechanism of carbon lock-in essentially where there is so much vested interest making money off fossil fuels that it's very difficult to even get the will to get the united will to do anything about it and because of that i don't think we see nuclear i don't think we see enough renewable energy and storage i just think we see continued fossil fuels because the people that make money out of fossil fuels use that money to ensure that we keep using fossil fuels and i think that's largely like where we are and that's where we're going to stay until you know the (laughs) mother nature fights back and so whilst i still think we should continue the struggle to try and get off fossil fuels i don't see the goodies winning in any meaningful sense i do think that you know the goodies are making progress but will it be enough i think at the start of this segment you sort of just outlined how unlikely it seems like that will be enough and so yeah my takeaway is we're going to have really bad climate change impacts i think we're already starting to see them and I think that we'll see more of them. I think in particular, it's going to be very pertinent for our children's generation. And I guess my priority as a father is to try and make sure that my children have happy childhoods and just have happiness in their life every step of the way. I think that if you truly do believe that the world is going to suffer catastrophic climate change, then that's slightly 
changes the calculus in terms of deferred gratification. I wouldn't like to no, that's see. That's an interesting thought. So, like, so that's kind of what I'm interested in is like what happens and like it's only six years away when we, I think we miss them. So, yeah, one one option is that just people start partying more, basically. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that. But yeah, that's like, is that kind of what you're getting at, Claude? Like, you know, I'm not, not a prediction of what people will do, but certainly yeah. that is what I'm getting at. So, I don't think that the actual missing the goals was necessarily important. I think what's important is that there are like feedback systems. Systems. You know, you have big wildfires that kills huge amounts of carbon sinks, which which means that carbon dioxide increases even faster as environments become under stress. You see, and we're already seeing this clearly, like more refugee crises, like people can't survive in a place they've historically survived anymore. They need to move. That probably fuels some form of deglobalization, potentially more conflict. We have there was a golden moment where people could sort of act together quite well, but it's like breaking down a little bit. And I'm not sure that we like have going to have good adaptations. I don't think we will have good adaptations in time, although probably, you know, such adaptations could be possible to, to lessen the blow, especially in richer places. But yeah, ultimately I think that the calculus that I would have made as a young person, probably it was a good bet to to make decisions that are deferred gratification. You know, I'm not going to go out to this concert I'm going to stay in and work on my like honors thesis or whatever. Like I want to make sure my kids have fun every step of the way. Like I, every, every year of their life, every month of their life, every every week of their life, I want them to do something that makes them happy because I don't want them working to some goal when they're 40 and like everything's burning down then anyway. So that that's kind of how I think about it. All right. Well, sorry to take us to a dark place, but I'm trying to trying to focus on the investing thing because I think it's just not talked about. And yeah, so anyway, uh, it's still something to keep brewing over. What else we got? Any any small cap news caught you guys' eye? I mean, one I'll throw out is uh, the former CEO of Dubba is not allowed to leave the country. So we don't know what's going on there. And I don't want to allege anything that's going on, but $26 million dollars roughly was missing from a term deposit account. That was an update and that the CEO had been stood down. And now the latest news is that the CEO has been barred from ASIC from leaving the country. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's It's surprising. It's the first time I've seen that happen for an ASX company that would follow for a while. And Mm -hmm. yeah, just anyway, I think it's noteworthy. (laughs) uh, Maybe you'll have to cut this out. (laughs) <laughs> we spoke about Dubber on this pod really early on and I believe it was one of the IR people who looked after it reached out to us afterwards or it was me and sort of said oh, I think you guys are a bit off on some of these points here and I said great let's let's line up an interview and talk about it and it's never happened and I always just thought that that was kind of interesting it was more like no you're wrong oh okay why tell us why don't want to <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I wrote an article for reasons I knew Double was a dumpster fire, but I realized I like made it supporters only because I just like don't want the the anger of of baggies or or whoever it is like writing into me. But at a high level, you know, I just think that the the, the level is like first all you see is like you know a cockroach or a little bit of mold or whatever, and then later you find out about you know the rotting meat underneath the the kitchen and the last tenants just dumped all their rubbish in the backyard and that the, the, the ceiling leaks or whatever you know so it's like yeah all of the ephemeral stuff that's like a little bit bad a little bit bad like sometimes that's all the warning you get and then suddenly you're in trading halt so this was one of those ones too wasn't it where it's just i mean you can't deny the revenue growth it was just hockey sticking right and you get no i don't is, know it was a- mate i don't think it was hockey sticking it's not they had silly little charts that made it look like it was hockey sticking but like yeah like one of the the reasons that i criticize it right is back in 2021 they took advantage of a lofty share price to raise capital and as part of that capital raising they had one of these sort of exponential like graphs or whatever showing revenue but but they never actually went on to achieve that hockey stick growth. And in actual fact, FY 2023 growth was uh, of revenue that was was 20% up, right? Compared mm. to 25% growth in FY 2022. So the growth rate was actually slowing. Yeah, but it was still, it was still, I mean, you know, in 2018, there were basically less than 2 million in revenues and then 30 million last year. And just in receipts from customers, they were like under a million in 2017, three in 2019 and then 36 in 2023. 
league. So I don't, I'm not trying to sing the praises for it. But, and obviously this is why you look sort of deeper. But it is an intoxicating drug when you see a good story and you see the top one. I know, I'm going to speak for myself here. because I got to push back on you on this. Like it wasn't No, please, please do. Please, it, no, it was, please do. It was a terrible story. I'm like trying, it was, I'm trying it was to say the, the same thing. I'm trying to say the same thing. My, my, no, my no, no like, excuse for I think it's a red flag. Anybody, any, like. Wait, do you think you the in, CEO being barred from leaving the country is a red flag? <laughs> yes. Do I? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think there were tons of red flags with this one. I think there were plenty of red flags with this one ages ago. Like the the average you guys are in agreement with though. I think Andrew's point is just that there was a lot of revenue growth as well. Andrew's so more like forgiving. That, no, where we disagree is Andrew's like, I can totally see how you would have like liked this one and it would have been seduced you or whatever. And I'm like, no, it couldn't have. It's, <laughs> it's the, this was a really obvious turn. Like, yeah, it's it might be obvious to you. Yeah, but I mean, there's there's a there's a very wide spectrum of people who have had experience and you know what what would have Claude of 15 years ago thought? You know, it's not. No I don't way, want to be too way, critical. There's no way I would have ever no, invested in this one. Yeah, like, I, I, way, way. I didn't touch it with a barge pole either. I, I did nothing but bad things to say about it. I've invested in some pretty bad companies, man. This this one this one was even too bad for me. I'll say to Andrew's point, I know some. I do know some very good investors who did invest in it at different points of it. So yeah, yeah. I guess this is the point. I mean, it, it's 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 a warning for all of us. I think that's the, just, that's yeah. what I'm going to say. There's a lesson to be drawn out of that, and that is, and this is, and I say this for myself more than anyone because I am the optimist or the wanna the wanna believe kind of guy when it comes to some of these stories is that you you see an interesting product it's disrupting a certain way of doing things there's getting a lot of traction at the top line it's backed up by operating cash flows everything outside of that is a is a is a, is a disaster okay right I get and that and importantly share price goes up right yeah, that's what I think. I think that people were overweighting the share price goes up. It was a story and share price goes up and that's how it gets people in. And I do agree with you and in in the point you're making, the broader point, which is like, I definitely think that the share price going up becomes this sort of thing where people are like, well, it must be good then, right? But you have to be careful with that. Absolutely. Yeah, like, that's great. Try and Strong imagine agree. what you would think of this company if the share price wasn't going up. You know, this is a company that, that never got better than about 50% gross margins, mm. but averaged about 40% growth, gross margins over like, say the last four years. So it really like in, in any objective way, like if you can't, what I object to or with Dubbo is like, there are people that are like, yeah, this, you know, could become a high quality company. It had none of the hallmarks of becoming a high, like, what are your objective measures of a high quality business? Like an ability to reinvest at high rates of returns. Well, it's not profitable. And in fact, its losses were massive and its gross margins. Well, it's not losses were growing. Yeah. So it definitely didn't classify in that. Like competitive advantage, pricing power. Again, like the, the super low gross margins is telling you it does not have pricing power. So I don't, like there are times when there are companies that have low gross margins that you would say are high quality businesses, but that is because they can reinvest at high rates of returns. An example of that, I think we talked about recently that we quite like, in my view, would at least be medium quality, maybe high quality is Dicker Data. And yeah, they're like super low, low margins, competitive business, but the history of them over 10 years shows, you know, they make, they get, a, they invest in a bigger, you know, in a bigger warehouse and their profit goes up, you know? So they have those options to invest in their business, which disclaimer, I own shares in, in Dicker Data, but you know, that would be something you can at least build your like high quality argument ar around there. And it's, I guess, low margins for what it was saying, a SaaS company as well versus uh, uh, distributors have low margins, they're a high, a high asset turn. You can offset that with low margins. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll wrap it there because otherwise we might say something we regret and I think that we covered it pretty well any other small cap news that caught your eye yeah look i thought i'd just you know try and bring back the old small cap micro cap news segment given not many people do talk about these kind of little companies and one that caught my eye yesterday because i think i think we might have talked about it on the show before is xref so i think i'm the most guilty of us talking about bad companies that i've dabbled with i think of the three of us i'm the most guilty of kind of trying to like xref at certain times in the past i definitely have owned it long ago now and oh my you know i won't list off all of the reasons since why I don't own it now. But I just did think they did an announcement the other day, graduate verification and certification checks launched. And what got my goat was it was marked market sensitive 
right? Which means a reasonable person should expect it to have, a, you know, a, an impact. impact on the value yeah. of the securities, right? All I could, it seemed to be just a product launch. It says, prior to the launch of Trust Marketplace, only a small collection of background checks from a handful of vendors were available on XRF's original platform, you know, and 110 clients were making an average of 1,000 checks a month. The launch of Trust Marketplace now provides XRF with the ability to migrate these clients over to the new enterprise platform, as well as offer a wider range of vendors, checks and features to other clients. So it's just an ability, right? They're getting an, they're announcing a new ability that they have. And then the other thing, graduate qualifications, they're announcing a partnership where Rapid Idea will act as the exclusive wholesale gateway for graduation verification services, servicing all retailers who seek qualification verification as part of their offerings. Qualification verification using GVS is now available to all XREF customers via XREF's Trust Marketplace. So again, it's just an ability thing. So they've announced these two uh, new abilities and as far as I can sell, there's no actual guaranteed revenue with them or anything. You know, the market itself, like, yeah, the, on the day, the share price went up 5%, but it's at 10 cents. And what happened was $11,000 worth of shares traded at 10 and a half cents. So I would hardly say the market moved in any way in response to this, nor would I expect it to. It's like, can you imagine if every ASX company announced every product feature let alone then claimed it was market sensitive. I don't understand how in 2024, like companies are still like just meaningless. Like I, d I strongly disagree that this is a market sensitive announcement. And, you know, I just don't see how it could possibly be. And, and if more importantly, if this is market sensitive, then freaking anything is market sensitive. So yeah, look, unimpressed, unimpressed. Anyway, that company is going to do what it's going to do. Uh, what, what else? The other bit of news that I thought might be interesting, Satire. Now this, I don't think any of us any, have any position in this one, but a long time ago, I actually owned shares in it and, and traded it. And, and boy, did I trade out of that too soon. But a bit of a battleground stock. I don't think it's ever really been 100% clear what like the source to their success has been. But the, I guess the news is now is people are asking questions about the, the way the company processes like the duties and taxes that they collect. And indeed, the company says they've like changed something in their checkout now. So they're like rolling it into one. So I guess like the price will include more of the actual taxes or whatever, which I do think is significant because I think one of the big ways that they get traffic is you, you search for like Gucci handbag, I want to say, but I don't even know if that's true. But you, you search for the item and then Setire comes up. Gucci handbag is a bad example. Yeah, basically Setire comes up with often like the lowest, the lowest price, I guess. So I don't think it can be good for them if they're if they're putting that that main price higher than it was before. Having said that, yeah, no, no real strong view on the stock. It's just that I don't think it has been well explained what is the secret to their success o over the course of time, and and that is what make that's what makes it a battleground stock. Because I guess I guess there's, there's a sense in the market that people don't fully understand how this business makes money, how it grows, how it succeeds. Yeah, I, I, surface level, it just seems really replicable. <laughs> very cyclical G given that say like their bigger competitors aren't doing well at the moment it I definitely sympathize with the people looking at this and being saying, hang on, you know, how are these guys doing so much better? Like it, it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be that much like excess return available to them. And I guess, you know, in some cases, certainly the amount of duties paid by satire to governments hasn't matched up with the amount that had been estimated when people were purchasing the goods. Hmm. I mean, it looks like it's growth in customers and not just in spend and maybe it's just i'm not saying it's double but it's the double thing is you can always you know grow customers if you're selling you know two dollars for 190 but that doesn't make sense either though because they're profitable right so what is it maybe it has something to do with these duties is it the destination thing like it just somehow for whatever reason they in that I just, first first ish mover in that tier where they've just become like people who like the good stuff and who don't really care to shop around just know if i go here i'm gonna get it and they've, they've got that destination or I, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip here i don't know if that's the no, case but they do have like a brand but at the same time they weren't first mover like farfetch or whatever's big yeah, i think yeah. that I think it has to do with price is how they get their growth. And then the question is, so how are they so profitable whilst having the lowest prices? And I guess one idea would be, well, there's some sort of loophole here. Like, because if the amount is over, say, $1,000, then in some places you have to pay tax. Well, I think it's $800 or something like that. But then if it's below that, you don't. So maybe there's some sort of arbitrage going on in terms of basically like whether they're, you know, the, the, the tax rules, essentially. Is there some exploit there? 
and if there is, is it legal? I guess is the second question. I don't know the answer to any of that. I guess what I'm reporting here is that <laughs> there's clearly been times when the estimated tax hasn't matched up with how much like has actually been paid on the goods once they've been sent. Hmm, interesting. All right, should we wrap it up, gents? Did you have any other closing things you want to chat about? Wait, we got to do our gratitude one. Oh, I just thought, oh, he's forgotten. He's forgotten. <laughs> no, you're not getting away that well. All right, I already said it in in my good news, but I'm I'm grateful for you know the weekend coming up. Looking forward to getting in the water, having like one one last dip before you know the, the cold weather arrives. Essentially, it's a simple pleasure. Go simple for a pleasure. swim. <laughs> I'm grateful for Andrew buying a house. I'm very happy for you, Andrew, and I'm glad <laughs> Thanks, that you uh, you finally got on the ladder. Yeah. <laughs> no, it looks like a really beautiful place you got. So I don't know. What am I? I? Look, I'm not a bird watcher by any stretch, and maybe this is just a sign of the increasing advancement of my age or something. But like, I'm noticing a lot of really cool bird life around here. There's king parrots, there's rosellas, kookaburras, there's butcher birds. It's like, oh, it's really nice. It's That's nice to wake one, up mate. with all of those birds, just yeah, and doing their thing. It's pretty cool. It's like you wake up in the garden of eden you have like the world's most colorful birds outside your window it's the sm- it's the little things well it used to be waking up to like a siren and someone like screeching down the road and like someone having a massive argument next door so it's yeah I'm, i could get used to this are you guys familiar with the difference between hedonism and epicureanism uh i i am a i'm a big subscriber to hedonism but uh tell me <laughs> yeah, this yeah. other other way oh, we all love a bit of hedonism but i guess that like in in an abstract sense that's more looking at like the peak, like maximizing pleasure or whatever. Whereas Epicureanism is more about, uh, I guess, finding happiness through moderate pre- uh, moderate pleasures and the avoidance of pain and suffering, essentially. So you lost you lost me at moderate. No, but it's like that's Pass. what the gratitude thing's about. Like if you can like generate some happiness from listen, like seeing the birds outside your window, like that's a maintainable level. We were talking about yeah, this nice. the other day. It's like you just yeah. adjust to the peaks, right? So what you yeah. want to do is like inch up that maintainable level of, of like moderate, sustainable happiness by like ha- finding it in all these little things. Man, give it a month. I'll be doing ice baths in the front yard and just going, let me really lean into all of that Wim stuff. Half. Yeah. Yeah. all right let's wrap it there gents thanks very much cheers thanks guys thanks for listening everyone have a great day